Christ is risen. I invite you, if you're able, to stand to, uh, together as we begin with the call to worship. From a parenting app that we use, I was reading and reminded about Psalm 31, which is, or Proverb 31, rather, which is a proverb famous for uh, this picture it paints of the perfect woman. Um, and it, it's really today's superhero. It says, the wife of noble character, describing really something that's nothing short of, well, intimidating. Getting up before dawn, making her family's clothing, uh, conducting a lucrative business with her handiwork. Uh, it would be a beautiful picture if it weren't so daunting. Um, and it uses the, the words, a, a woman of valor. But it's interesting that in the Jewish faith, this proverb isn't about something that women should aspire to be, but rather a celebration of what they already are and, and what they've already become. Uh, a celebration of, of who they, uh, the women in, in the community are in our midst. Um, and so when we come to worship, all of us, this is true for all of us, that's the starting point is not what we can be or what we aspire to be. It's what God has, has already done, what God, uh, who God, what God is doing in our midst, and celebrating that together. So with that in mind, let us worship God together. be seated. I invite you to join with me in a time of, of confession, of just recognizing uh, that we come before gracious God and that we can bring all of who we are before God. Let's pray together. Gracious God, here we are uh, with open hands to show you all that we think we are hiding from you, but we know that we cannot. You are loving and kind we confess to you our sins, for they are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to, the, to your future in which we will be changed. Grant us your grace to grow more and more into your likeness. It's this we pray through Jesus Christ, our saving Lord. Amen. Done. 
Why don't we stand, give God thanks together. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ together. Welcome to our time of worship. It's good to be together with you all. If you're newer with us, a special welcome to you and hope that you find uh, a welcome in this place and uh, a place where you can meet Christ, but also others uh, as, we, as we gather together in our time. Special welcome, of course, to all of the, the ladies, the women that are with us here. Um, happy Mother's Day. Uh, we, it, at, at Faith, it's, it's really important for us to, to recognize that the, all of women, whether you have children, whether your children are grown, whether they're here with you, um, play just a, a really special and important role as um, those who, who just help to fill in our community, to, to nurture us, to, um, to help be a, be a part of, of guiding, guiding us. My own mother was, was with our family this last weekend, and uh, they went off to the coast uh, today. Uh, even mothers need some time away from their children, my own included, uh, at times. But, um, but hope that as, as, you, as you gather here, that, uh, that you know that you are s- such an important part of this community, um, guiding your own children and those who are not as well. There are some flowers in the Welcome Center as you leave today. Really in, would invite you to, if, to take one of those with you as a, a celebration of this day and, and who you are to all of us together. Uh, the, the bulletin that you received as you came in has a lot of information in there and the guide for the service today. I invite you to take that with you today. Also, if you're near the center, uh, great if you could take one of these friendship books and pass those along too. That's very helpful for us as well. Another note that the Men and Boys Retreat is coming up the second weekend in June, June 10 to 12. Um, this is, once again, not a father-son retreat, not just a men's retreat. This is a chance for all uh, men and boys of this community to gather and to uh, celebrate for a weekend away at Westminster Woods Camp. Uh, so come join us for that. We are, we're really hoping that this is going to be, um, uh, we're going to burst at the seams just a little bit after we have not been able to, to do that as, as much as we have liked in the past couple of years. So, so join us for that. Ask questions if you need to. There's scholarships available also, so I'd love to have you be a part of that great experience. Uh, lastly, we want to have a, an opportunity to talk about Walk for Water, which is in two weeks. Many of you know what this is. Uh, this is a chance for us to walk about a mile, one, uh, one way and a mile back, um, and one of those directions carry a jug or container of some kind or a couple of water uh, to recognize what people, uh, families, and children around the world have to do to, to um, collect water and the impact that that, that makes, and, and to also raise some funds for our partner organization, World Vision, to be able to continue the good work they're already doing in that regard. Um, I know you've heard some about this in this past few years. We want to continue that good work. Let me just show you a quick video and then tell you a little bit of how to get involved. I love this video because oftentimes we focus on um, 
how much we still have to do, and there is still a lot of work to do in this world, but this is an achievable goal for everyone in the world to have clean water, and we're moving in that direction, and this is uh, Kamama's story here is a, is a, a sign that we are moving in that, that good direction. It says 6K, 6 kilometers up there. Ours is about half that, so that's, that's the good news. Um, we uh, will have an opportunity between services on May 22nd, starting about 10.15, to say a prayer of blessing and then, and then head off uh, down Florin Road and, and up Gloria to our, through the cabana uh, pool where we'll collect water and, and bring that back. Uh, you, in the Welcome Center afterwards, David Nash will be there to take sign-ups for that and to answer any more questions to be a part of that. Uh, we'll need some volunteers to help with that as well, so um, you could let Dave know and he'll put your name on a list. For that as well. But it's going to be a great uh, opportunity and, and celebration to be a part of that. Also on that, that day, maybe one of the last, if not the last uh, Sunday that the Ethiopian church that we uh, share space with on Sunday mornings will be with us as, before they move into their own building that they have acquired, um, which, is, which, is, which is a celebration for them, but also sad for us. So uh, but we're hoping that, that, that we can celebrate with them on that day, too, and, and pray for them uh, as they go their own way in that. So um, take part with us. It's going to be a great event together. Let's continue in our time of worship. Not to overpromote it, but how many of you could walk um, two miles? Come on, all of you. Most of you. <laughs> How many have ever walked two miles for water? Like to, that you really need. None of us, right? So I was just in Kenya last week. I just, one, one more just plug in. I would love to see all of us do this and just as a, raising some awareness that this is what people go through. So it's a great event and really encourage you to be a part of it. M many of you received word this week that uh, Colleen Schnell uh, passed away. Um, not a lot of you probably knew Colleen. Some of you did, you know, Phyllis and Tanya and others who knew her before she came here. But she's been a part of our community here for, for some time now. And sometimes I stand at the back of the, the sanctuary and greet people as they come. And uh, she's at the top of the list in terms of people that came out with a joyful spirit. And every Sunday, she just, was just thrilled to be a part of this community. And so we really, we grieve her loss. We grieve with her family. Um, whether you knew her or not, I want to ask you to be holding her up, her family and friends in your prayers this week as they will grieve and gather to celebrate her life. Um, so this morning, we'll light a candle in her memory and, and then offer a prayer and ask you to join me in that. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the life of this dear sister, one who, from all I could tell, was full of joy to know you and to know your people. We thank you that the pain of this life for her is now ended. We entrust her life into your hands. We celebrate the resurrection. We claim that promise for her and for ourselves. We pray now for her family, for her friends, those who now are left behind, who grieve her loss and have to navigate life without her. We pray for their comfort and healing, which we know will come in time. We thank you for the promises you make to us through Christ. In his name we pray, amen. We have the opportunity this morning to celebrate the ordination and installation of deacons in our church. We have three offices here in our church, the office of pastor and elder and deacon, and each one of those is, is critically important for the life and health of the church. Deacons are those who are called to, to a witness of compassion and service, to care for those among us. Um, I've been in many churches, and... I don't like to compare, but the deacons in this church do ministry as well as any deacons I've ever seen. They really take their calling seriously, and so it's with joy that we get to welcome in some, 
some new uh, deacons, so I want to invite the, f- the four who are here this morning um, to come and join me up front as we prepare to ordain and install them. Uh, also invite Barbara to come. Barbara has been the chair of the nominating committee. Maybe we'll have you all stand over here on this side here. Most of you know these women, uh, but just in case, Candy and Pat and Kathy and Audrey, thank you for your willingness to serve, to reserve. Some of you have served as deacons before, and so we are grateful for that. I, I brought the baptismal up front, usually in the, in the back of the sanctuary, as a reminder to us that when, we're, when we serve, we, it's, we're serving out of our, our call from our baptism, that when we are baptized, a few years ago probably for, for all of us, um, we're invited into God's family included as his sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in Christ. And your family, like my family, comes with privileges and responsibilities, right? My kids have privileges as my children, um, blessings that Esther and I give them, but they also have responsibilities. And so we, as children of God, have incredible privileges and blessings as his children, but also responsibilities to serve him and to join him in the work of his kingdom. And so you, you, I just want to affirm that you are responding to your, your baptismal call this morning to take up the responsibilities that God gives us as his children, in particular as deacons. So we are grateful for your obedience and faithfulness. So, thank you, Barbara. Please join me in the litany of ordination and installation. There are different gifts. It's the same spirit who gives them. There is, are different ways of serving God. It's the same Lord who served. God works through different people in different ways. It's the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit. To use it for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ. And individually members of him. Though we have different gifts, Together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make his church useful in the world, and we call men and women to faith so that in the end every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as ministers of the word, ruling elders or deacons, In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, remembering that our Lord Jesus said, whoever among you wants to be great must become the servant of all, and you who want to be first, you must be the slave of all. Just as Christ came not not, not to be served, but to serve and give his life to set others free. Speaking for the members of this congregation, I bring these individuals to be ordained and installed as deacons at Faith Presbyterian Church. I want to ask you to respond to these uh, ordination questions um, in the presence of God and of the community of, of his people. Do you treat, do you, excuse me, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you, do you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will. 
Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And now for the congregation. Do we, members of the church, accept these women as deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? We do. I want to invite those of you who are elders, ordained elders in the church to come, and we have an opportunity to lay hands and pray for, for these new deacons. Um, so if you'd come up, and, and if you're willing and able, you're welcome to kneel or welcome to stand. It's up to you. But um, we'd like to gather around you and pray for you. Let's pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you call forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people Israel, you anointed prophets and priests and rulers. You called pastors and teachers and bishops, elders and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons, elders, and pastors served together and so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, Lord, for the church of Christ, we give you thanks and praise. And so God of grace, pour out your spirit this day on Audrey and Kathy and Pat and Candy that they would be faithful deacons in our church. Give them an openness to the Holy Spirit's leading that they would see and serve wherever there's a need. Train them in the school of prayer that they would express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, the sick, those who grieve, those who are troubled. Equip them with courage to bear the gospel into the halls of power and to communicate your presence that those among us who are powerless would be lifted up. In everything, Lord, give them the mind of Christ, that they not grasp a greatness, but empty themselves to become your servants. Give them joy as they walk in faith, sense of your presence as they work in ministry. Gracious God, through the waters of baptism, you claim us as your own and call us to, to share in Christ's ministry. So pour out your spirit upon these women that they would discern the gifts you've given them, calling them forth from one another and together use those gifts for the good of all in obedience to Christ and the unity of the Spirit. May they proclaim good news, make disciples, be light and leaven, share bread, offer cups of cold water, wash another's feet, make us all strong in Christ to live as your people and show forth your love in this world by the power of your Spirit. We pray all these things. Amen. Join me in just expressing our appreciation to these women. I want to invite whatever children are here this morning to come and join me for a couple minutes in the first row, if you would. All right, good to see you guys today. Take care of mom today, right? Okay, I know you will. Um, 
So in a second, my friend David's going to read us a part of Scripture. And this is from the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at Jesus' teaching here. And Jesus is, is teaching us to live the right way, how to live the way that he wants us to live. Um, and as we let God teach us how to live the right way, here's something that can happen. We start living the right way, and then we start looking at people who are not living the right way, and you know what happens? We start to think that we are better than they are. Maybe this, hap maybe this happens to you in school. Like, you're doing what the teacher wants you to do. Doing, you're just being, you're being good. You're following the rules. And you look over and you see kids in R, and you start thinking, well, I'm, I'm better than they are. <laughs> Or maybe in your family, if you have brothers and sisters, uh, you're, you're following the rules, you're doing what your parents want you to do, and your brother or sister's not, and you sort of think, well, I'm, I'm really like the good son, I'm really like the good daughter here, right? And we can have this attitude or thought in our mind that we somehow are better than other people. And Jesus knows this is something that can happen to us, and it doesn't just happen to kids, I'm telling you, <laughs> it happens to older people too. We start looking around and we're living the way God wants us to live, we think, and then we think others aren't, and we start to think we're better. And so Jesus has a warning for us about that. And I want you to listen carefully for what the warning is um, as David comes to read here. Okay, so let's listen. Good morning. Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter seven verses one through six. We invite you to follow along in your pew Bible, page six in the back in the New Testament, or easier yet, it's uh, embedded in your worship bulletin. Uh, Matthew seven, one through six. Listen for the word of the Lord. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For the judgment you give will be the judgment you get, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take that speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jesus has this picture of this person who has a little speck of dust in their eye, and then another person who has a big log sticking out of their eye. And the person with the log says, let me help you with that little speck of dust while they've got this big log. It's kind of a funny picture. What I'd love for you to do when you get home today is talk, talk for a minute with your family about what, what is that about? What's he trying to teach us there with this guy with the log and the person with the speck? And think about that together. And um, God has something really important to teach us here. So let's pray, okay? Lord God, thank you for your, your word to us. Help us to be open this morning, to listen to your voice. Um, may my words be right in line with what you want to teach us and our hearts open to that as well. And we would be changed and live like you want us to live. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, you guys can follow Jacob. Have a great time, okay? Good to be back with you. As some of you know, I've been in Kenya for um, the last week and a half or so and exploring with some others the possibility of a, starting a Bible school there, and it's been a great, fruitful experience. I'd love to tell you more about it at some other point, but I appreciate your prayers and also for Dennis and Brett for preaching in my absence. I um, did get a chance to preach last week in a, in, a, in a rural church in Kenya, and I put a video on House to House, a greeting from that congregation. They... Presbyterians from around the world send, send you their 
their, uh, their love. As we look at this this morning, we're continuing to go through this uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I want to remind you of a, take you back 20 years or so, Ted Haggard, you might remember that name, was an American pastor. Uh, he was a founder of a church called New Life in Colorado Springs, and he also served as the president of the NEA, which is the National Evangelical Association, in the early 2000s. In 2006, Ted Haggard used his considerable influence to campaign in favor of Colorado Amendment 43, which would have banned same-sex marriage in that state. One of many socially conservative efforts that were on the agenda of the NEA at that time. Well, because of his stand against gay marriage and other progressive efforts, there were whole sections of the American church who thought very little of Ted Haggard. He certainly would not have been welcomed into the fellowship of many progressive congregations at that time. Well, that same year, however, Ted Haggard was exposed. This is all over national media. A male prostitute in Denver revealed that Haggard had paid him for sex over a three-year period, and also during that time that he had regularly purchased and used crystal meth. Now, though Ted Haggard initially uh, denied the allegations, the evidence piled up against him, and he eventually confessed to much of it, forfeiting his position as both pastor and president of the NEA. Very quickly then, whole other sections of the American church now thought very little of Ted Haggard. Even after he repented and confessed the truth and voluntarily resigned his positions of leadership and submitted to the discipline of others. It didn't matter. Now, countless progressive Christians alongside evangelical Christians, people who likely could agree on very little else, now did agree in their judgment that Ted Haggard was unworthy and unwelcome for inclusion in their fellowship. This was, many determined, not a man who knew or walked with God. Well, at that time, Michael Cheshire was another pastor in Colorado, and at least at first, he was among that number who'd condemned Ted Haggard. By his own admission, he said, in those days, I could care less about this man. All the condemnation he was receiving was well-deserved. But all that changed in one short afternoon. He's sitting down with lunch with a friend of his who's not a Christian, and this man tells him, I could never be a Christian myself because I'm watching the widespread total condemnation of Ted Haggard at the hands of, of, of the church. And in his words, he said, I'm, I'm convinced Christians eat their own. And that comment promoted Cheshire to make a decision to reach out and try to meet with Ted Haggard himself. I want you to listen to a portion of what he wrote in a Christianity Today article that he titled, Going to Hell with Ted Haggard. In less than five minutes of talking with Ted, I realized a horrible truth. I liked him. He was brutally honest about his failures. He was excited that the only people who, could who would talk with him were the truly broken and hurt. I met his wonderful wife, Gail. She's a terrific teacher of grace and one of my heroes. And so I became close friends with Ted Haggard. But the funniest thing started happening to me. Some Christians I hung out with told me they would distance themselves from me if I continued reaching out to Ted. Several people in my church told me they would leave. Really? Does he have leprosy? Will he infect me? But in the end, I was told that my voice as a pastor and author would be tarnished if I continued to spend time with him. I had a hard time understanding why we as Christians really needed Ted to crawl on the altar of church discipline and die. When Ted crawled off that altar and into the arms of a forgiving God, we chose to kill him with our disdain. I wrestled with my part in this until I got an epiphany. In a quiet time of prayer, Christ revealed to me a brutal truth. It was my fault. We are called to leave the 99 and go after the one. We are supposed to be numbered with the outcasts. After all, we are the ones that believe in resurrection. In many ways, I have not been aggressive enough with the application of the gospel. My concept of grace needed to mature, to grow muscles, teeth, and bad breath. It needed to carry a shield. And most of all, 
It needed to find its voice. If you remember Ted Haggard, I, I, I wonder how you felt about him when he made the news. I wonder how you might feel about him today. I do remember these events, clearly. And I also remember, to be honest, at that time, the thought of reaching out to him to build a friendship would, would be the last thing on my mind. When the Sermon on the Mount, as we've covered so far, chapters 5 and 6, Jesus describes for his followers essentially the, the extraordinary nature of the Christian life. He's saying to us, if you follow after me as my disciple, my apprentice, I'm going to call you to an exclusive devotion to me. And he begins to teach disciples things like how to set aside anger and contempt and lust and manipulation and payback and how to stop depending on human praise and on material wealth. These are the things we've looked at these last number of weeks. And these are the things Jesus is teaching disciples here. But if we begin to follow Jesus in these ways, a dangerous thing happens, as I mentioned to the kids earlier. Even though it's only by God's grace that our lives are transformed to look like Jesus, as our lives are changed, we can begin to adopt a superior attitude, especially towards those who are not living in the ways that we are learning to live. And it's likely for this reason that Jesus offers this warning that we just read at the beginning of chapter 7. Again, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment that you make, you'll be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. And we should all heed his warning. The response to Ted Haggard that Michael Cheshire observed and experienced across the church is not foreign to us. And though it's often subtle, I hear whispers of this sort of judgment, even here at Faith, in the way that some of us speak about individuals or whole groups of people who somehow we deem are beneath us. I hear it in the way sometimes people speak about certain other Christian denominations, you know, those Baptists or those Catholics or those people in those megachurches. I hear it in the way sometimes people speak about, quote-unquote, those evangelicals or those progressives, especially the radical variety of each. And to be honest with you, sometimes I'm hearing it so clearly because it's coming out of my own mouth. And so when Jesus tells his disciples not to judge others, he's not talking to others, he's talking to me, and he's, he's talking to you, and we need to heed his warning. Now, that word judge here in the English is the Greek word krino. I think the next slide there, maybe, Paul. One more slide. There you go. Uh, it literally means to separate or to divide out. I had a dentist appointment a couple weeks ago, my semi-annual checkup, and my dentist was in a krino kind of mood that day. And so he, which is what dentists are supposed to do, right? He, he looked carefully at my teeth. He shined a light in there, he poked around, he um, even took x-rays, and then he passed judgment. Most of my teeth he deemed to be righteous. Not the word he used, but he, he, uh, you get the point. But there was one tooth back here on the top here that he deemed to be unrighteous. Again, not the word he used, but what he did say is that that tooth has to come out. It's got no place with the other teeth, and if it's left in place, it will actually corrupt the other teeth. That's crino. <laughs> That's separating the righteous from the unrighteous and removing the unrighteous. And Jesus warns us, do not do that with each other. But a warning about his warning, in my opinion, this is likely one of the most misinterpreted verses, passages in the entire Bible. Because more times than I can remember, I've heard people, Christian and non-Christian alike, say something like this. Jesus teaches us we're never supposed to, to judge anybody about anything. Just let people be. But is that really what Jesus says? That there's never a time when I can point out something in your life that, that's wrong or vice versa. Of course not. If you examine Jesus' whole teaching, it reveals that he never intended to say such a thing and never did say such a thing. The Bible, in fact, is full of examples telling us, even commanding us, 
to make judgments about the character and the maturity and the morality of other people around us. We just ordain deacons in our church. There's passages, I think, of like in 1 Timothy 3 where Paul is very clear that we should never appoint leaders in the church until after we have judged their fitness to lead and serve. In this very passage, in verse 6, which we'll look at next week, we are explicitly told by Jesus to make judgments about other people so we don't give to people something that's precious. Well, they will, they will abuse it. Matthew 18, that famous passage where Jesus says, listen, if there's someone in the church that sins and refuses to repent, even after efforts to get them to confess, and they don't kick them out of the church as a way to try to get them to come back in eventually through grace, through repentance. I could go on and give you many examples. So to be clear, Jesus does not condemn all judgment. So let's not be those people that go around and say, Jesus told us never to judge. He didn't say that. He's speaking about a certain type of judgment. And I really like how commentator Scott McKnight puts it. He says that to read this passage accurately, we must learn to distinguish moral discernment on the one hand from personal condemnation on the other. Because, of course, there are times when we have to use discernment about the character, about the faithfulness, about the morality of other people around us. All of you, all of us do this every day. What parent recruits a babysitter or what business owner hires an employee, or what pastor, I mean, what church calls a pastor without using some level of moral discernment. We have to use it. But this does not mean that we are then given license to take it further and make final judgments about other people, especially when that leads to some declaration of their standing before God or their ultimate destiny. What Ted Haggard did is flat out wrong on many levels. And it's right that it should be judged as such. Jesus gives us permission, I think, to make such discernment. But he does not give us permission to pretend we know God's verdict on his or any other human soul. Discern, yes, but don't damn. But this is hard for us, mostly because here, and let's just be honest about this, most of us, have some level of insecurity about our own righteousness, about our own standing before God. And so we seek righteousness through comparison. Though we would rarely admit, even to ourselves, this is what we're doing, but we are. And so we hear a story about somebody like Ted Haggard and immediately feel a little better about ourselves. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I'm not like that guy. I'm not that bad. And not just Ted Haggard, we can also see ourselves in an elevated position when we look at those, for instance, on the other side of the political aisle we just think are dead wrong, or those in other kinds of churches who don't see things the way we think we should be seeing them, or people with religious beliefs that are inherently false, or especially people who flat out rejected God or rejected Christ altogether. And our judgment on them can go well beyond moral discernment and and creep into personal condemnation. And when we do this, here's what's happening. This is where this is where this is the heart of what Jesus is teaching us here. We are choosing to measure righteousness with the yardstick of human effort or human goodness. And it's a sliding scale. And so we determine in our minds some arbitrary standard of righteousness, and then we declare that we are above that standard and we declare others are beneath it but it's a really dangerous game to play. And Jesus is clear, if you go around subjecting people to such standards of righteousness, require them to live up on their own to some standard that God has set, then that same expectation will be put onto your life. In other words, if you've settled in your mind that a person's ultimate standing before God is somehow dependent on some level of righteousness that they can achieve in their own life, then your standing before God will also be determined by some level of righteousness that you can attain in your own life. And are any of us absolutely confident that we can attain that righteousness on our own? You see, God says we can't. The cross itself is evident that we cannot. Why else would God's Son come and become one of us and though sinless suffer much and ultimately die in shame He did because we couldn't meet the standard. We needed forgiveness. 
Paul puts this clearly in Romans when he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, not some, but all, and that the wages of such sin are death. And so listen to me, this is, this is the good news here. The only way we attain a righteousness that puts us in good standing with our Creator is through the grace of God, which is given to us through Jesus Christ and received in faith. It's the only way. It's not our goodness that gains us God's favor. It's Christ's goodness alone. I think of how Paul prays in Philippians when he says that, prays that he would be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the martyr German theologian, put this so clearly in The Cost of Discipleship when he writes, the source of the disciple's life lies exclusively, exclusively in his fellowship with Jesus Christ. He possesses or she possesses his righteousness only within that association, never outside of it. That's why the disciple's righteousness can never become an objective criterion to be applied at will. In other words, here's put it simply, any, any righteousness you find in yourself is from Christ. It's Christ's righteousness. And so then how can you go around or I go around trying to justify ourselves comparing my performance to the performance of other people? Bonhoeffer goes on and says, there's only one judgment, one law, one grace. Henceforth, the disciple will look upon others as forgiven sinners who also owe their lives to the love of God. Have you ever noticed, if you've read the Gospels, how many times people go around and make faulty assessments about other people and their uh, standing before God? So often, people in the Gospels think that, they look at others and think that that person is the furthest from God that could possibly be, and Jesus ends up saying, no, that person's actually quite close to God. Do you think that we as religious people in our day are not subject to the same mistake? We are. We forget that true righteousness in the first place isn't a product of human effort or human morality. It's always, always, always a product of grace. Even if it were a product of human effort, we'd never have the ability to make judgments on others because we would never be in a position to make accurate assessments. Because we never know a person's true intentions because we can never look into a person's heart where those intentions are discovered in the way that God can see into a human heart. We also never know exactly what others have faced or gone through in this life, which is always going to be different from what we've faced or gone through, so it's not an even comparison. And to think that we do know these things means that we imagine we can see things from God's perspective, which we cannot. Furthermore, we perpetually tend to undervalue the size of our own faults while at the same time overvaluing the size of the faults of others. It's Jesus' point in verse 3 when he says, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye Well, there's a log sticking out of your own eye? Just recently, my wife and I are in the Bay Area and we, we are on this very busy road made even more busy because three lanes were merging quickly into two. It was really congested. And I watched right in front of me this unfold. A very aggressive driver went out of turn and cut right in front, forced himself right in front of the woman who was directly in front of me. And immediately she laid on the horn. She shook her fist out the window. She yelled some things I'm pretty sure her children or grandchildren wouldn't want to hear. But then within 30 seconds, I'm not exaggerating, I was stunned. Within 30 seconds, she did the exact same thing to another driver. I'm saying to my wife, do you see what's happening here? She cut him off in the exact same way she'd been cut off. And in, in that moment in my mind, I condemned her as a hypocrite. <laughs> Without remembering, I have done the exact same thing myself in traffic on countless occasions. Proverbs 22 21.2 declares, All deeds are right in the sight of the doer, but the Lord weighs the heart. You may have heard the saying before that the absent are never without fault, and those present are never without excuse. 
It's so easy to condemn the sins of others while excusing or minimizing our own sin, all the while ignoring the fact that doing so is the sin itself. In fact, some have suggested that the, that the log sticking out of the eye in Jesus' illustration might just be the condemning and critical spirit that he warns us here to avoid. Get rid of that, he says. And so what's the solution to this hypocrisy? Jesus makes it clear, simply we have to repent, which is just a fancy word that means change your mind, change the way you see things, turn around. In his words, he says, take the log out of your eye first, and then you'll be able to see clearly enough to take the speck out of your brother or sister's eye. So Jesus' point is not that we have worse sin than others. His point is that we have sin also. And once you recognize this, and also recognize the abundant and undeserved grace that God has shown to you in response to your sin, then something begins to change in your heart. The Roman Catholic priest Henry Nouwen was famous for saying that only wounded healers have the right to heal. Only wounded healers have the right to heal. Once I realize the level of grace that I've been shown and God begins to heal me, I can then begin to become the kind of person who extends that grace to others. In fact, I think we extend grace only to the extent that we have realized it's been extended to us first. As I said earlier, this does not exempt us from making discernments in life. Jesus is not saying here or promoting this idea that I'm okay, you're okay, which is a very popular idea in our culture. Especially in the church, we have to be committed to one another's moral progress, which means there's going to be times that I need to say to you and point out to you the sin in your life, and when you need to point out the sin in my life, we have to do that for each other. Always with love, always with humility, recognizing that we are also sinners ourselves. But Jesus doesn't say, leave the speck in your brother or sister's eye. He says, no, if you can remove it, help them to remove it. But make sure you took the log out of your own eye first. So I believe that Je the fact Jesus is teaching us these sorts of things tells us that Jesus believes that we can become, with his help, by his grace, these kinds of people. Now, honestly, I struggle with this every day. I hate it that so easily a critical spirit rises up in my heart towards other people. I can usually conceal it, but it's in there. And maybe you're the same. And so the truth is I really long to become the kind of person and long to be a part of a community of people who have found a way, by God's grace, to naturally and easily extend grace because they've received grace. Some of you, I know, I've heard some of your stories, you have been wounded because at some point in your life, previously, other people, specifically other people who self-identified as people of, of Christ, identified with Jesus, they didn't treat you as Jesus treats you. And maybe they even passed judgment on you about your standing before God. And such condemnation is deeply destructive. It cuts like a knife into the most vulnerable parts of a human soul. So maybe you are somebody who needs to hear, again, Jesus declare, as he did in John 3, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. Personalize this. God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn you, but so that you might know uh, and be saved, know him and be saved through him. If God doesn't condemn you, then nobody has a right to do so. If they did, and when they did, they did not speak for God. And so my prayer is that we would increasingly become a community here at Faith that is marked and shaped by this kind of grace. Not offering excuses for one another's sins, but also not condemning each other or even others beyond our, us for sin. In the words of one of my new favorite worship songs, the one who knows me best is the one who loves me most. So if the one who knows everything about us, all the worst, still loves us nonetheless, we must let him teach us how to do that with each other in turn. This is the way of the kingdom of God, and the kingdom has come near to us, and will one day come in all its fullness. 
Let me end with a story that I, I think most of you know well. I would say as much as any encounter that Jesus has in the Gospels, this particular encounter best summarizes his teaching here uh, about how to practice discernment without practicing damnation. One day, some very religious people who knew their Bible very, very well, they dragged a woman before Jesus. And she'd been caught in bed that night before with a man who was not her husband. Not good. But now she stood there in all of her shame. She's barefoot. She's disheveled. She's sweaty from an earlier struggle with her accusers, and her jaw is fixed, and her teeth are clenched. We're not told where her partner was. Apparently, he wasn't necessary for this meeting. It was her that the religious mob wanted to condemn. And so they say to Jesus, Teacher, this woman here was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Now we know that you know what Moses said about such women. The law gives us permission, binds us actually to stone her to death. She has no place with God. So what do you say? So they wanted to trap him, and she was their bait. If they could just get Jesus to publicly neglect God's law, which was written in stone, by showing forgiveness to such a blatant sinner, they would have the incrimination they needed to take him out. And so in response, you might remember, Jesus does something really strange. He bends down to the ground and begins to write with his finger in the dust. And to this day, nobody knows what he wrote. The silence, as he did so, must have been deafening. The, the drama was intense. I imagine the crowd continued to badger him, but he took his time, and eventually he stands back up, and all eyes are fixed on him, and he says this. He says, okay, go ahead with what you came to do. Stone her to death, but just one stipulation. Start with the sinless one among you. That person, the sinless one, should be the one to throw the first stone. And then he bends down and begins writing in the dirt again with his finger. And nobody says another word. Instead, one by one, they drop their stones and they walk away, beginning with the oldest, perhaps because he was the wisest or perhaps because he knew he had the most sin. Either way, suddenly it's just Jesus and this woman alone, the lawgiver and the lawbreaker. And Jesus says to her, and I can only imagine the tone of his voice, he says, woman, where did they go? Is there nobody left here to condemn you? And she says to him, no one, master, they all have left. And Jesus says to her, well, neither do I condemn you. Go on your way. You're free to go. You're free. But one more thing before you go. From now on, don't sin like that again, okay? If this is how Jesus treats us in the midst of our sin, how can we then turn and treat one another any differently? We cannot, and we must not. Amen. Let's take just a moment of silence and... Pay attention to whatever it is, I don't pretend to know, whatever it is Christ is saying to you in this moment, a word of challenge, a word of grace, whatever it might be, and reflect on what that is, and then we'll come and pray together in a few, in a few min minutes.
Let's pray together. Lord God, our Father in heaven, who shows us grace beyond what we could ask for or imagine, hear our prayers this morning. We're your people, so teach us to pray. Lord, on this day when we set aside to remember and honor and celebrate mothers, we give you thanks for each one of them. We're grateful that you chose to give us life through them. Thank you for the sacrifices that they made in carrying us and bringing us into this life. Lord, we thank you for the women who raised us, who were our mothers in childhood, whether birth moms or adopted moms or older sisters, aunts, grandmothers, stepmothers, some other women that you brought into our lives. We thank you for those who fed us and nurtured us and clothed us and disciplined us and cared for us. So God, we pray for the women of our church and of our community. We pray for older moms whose children are grown and gone. Grant them the joy of and satisfaction of a job well done. We pray for moms who, who are, are new moms experiencing changes they could never have predicted. Grant them rest and peace as they trust you for the future. We pray for women who are expecting a child, waiting for the day soon when they become a mom. Grant them patience and good counsel in the coming months. We pray for mothers among us who are single moms raising kids on their own. Grant them strength and wisdom and also a community nearby to share the load with them. We pray for moms in our world who raise kids in poverty. God, grant relief and justice. We pray for moms who are separated from their children, either because of distance or because of conflict. God, grant faith and hope and restoration. We pray for moms who are in marriages in crisis and grant healing and support and insight. We pray for moms who've lost children along the way, a pain as great as any in this life. We know, Lord, that you understand the depth of pain that accompanies the death of a child, and so grant healing and comfort and hope in the resurrection. We pray for moms who gave up their children for adoption Grant them peace and confidence as they trust in your providence. We pray for moms who adopted. Grant them joy and gratitude for the gift you provided. We pray for people present here who are grieving the loss of their own mother. Grant them the comfort and hope of the resurrection. And we pray for women in our midst who have desired to bear children and yet for one, one reason or another have been unable to do so for whom this day may be a source of pain. We don't pretend to understand these situations, Lord, but we lift these women to you, one who does understand. Father, in this world where our families are so vulnerable, we thank you that you have given us your family, the church, of which we can all be a part. We thank you that within your body we all receive what many of our families have failed to provide us. Help us become the kind of church where Every person here understands the gift of numerous brothers and sisters to encourage them and many parents who love and guide them. Lord, you've been good to us. Walk with us this week that we may make a difference for you in this world. As day by day, we conform our lives into the likeness of Christ. It's in his name that we pray these things and with the words that he taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Every good thing we have in life is a gift from God poured into the lives for us to enjoy and also to share with others for the sake of the gospel. In response to all of God's good gifts for us and for the sake of the world Jesus loves, 
Let us now worship the Lord by presenting God's tithe and our offerings. After worship is over, you may place your offering in the basket at the back of the sanctuary. You may also give online or by mail. Let's take a moment now to consider how we will worship God through our giving. pray together. Lord God, we dedicate to you uh, these offerings, uh, not just what we've given today, but our whole lives. And as always, we pray that you would use them for your purposes in this world, that others would come to know the grace we've come to know. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together. Just a couple of reminders as we go. Um, all the women of the church, whether you're a, a mom or not, we encourage you to grab a flyer on the way out just as a way for us to celebrate you and your, the gift you are to us. Um, the C.S. Lewis class will begin in a few minutes down in room two, so if you're part of that, we'll see you down there. Um, and also there'll be some folks here in the first row right here to pray. If there's a way that you could be encouraged with prayer today, we'd love to have you come up and just... Um, allow them to pray with you and for you. Um, 
as Reed leads us out with the light of Christ, go with this blessing. May the grace and peace of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day, now, and forevermore. Amen.